Okay, so this week, got a few things to talk about before we jump into the presentation about radar. Um, let's do, we'll do this, yes. Okay, I'm sure most of you are aware. First, we'll start out with the weather challenge. Um, if you're interested, uh, let me know, email me, or just tell me. I don't really care. Uh, five bucks a year. If you want, you don't have to do a year. You can do a semester if you want. It's three dollars a semester. Um, let's see here. And if you're wondering what was this website is, this is actually the weather challenge website. If you haven't been on here yet. It's completely been redone, um, and they've they've really switched it up. Um, so this is how you enter forecast now, which is pretty much the same. Um, the only thing that's not on here yet that I'm wondering if it's going to get put on here is any data. There's no USL data. There's no MOS data. There's no data whatsoever, and I don't know – when that's coming or if it's coming, I'm not sure. Um, the competition starts, uh, we'll start forecasting next week. Uh, Monday, we'll forecast for Tuesday, Tuesday for Wednesday, Wednesday for Thursday, and Thursday for Friday. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the data. That's one thing I'm really kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't get why it's not on here yet. Maybe they're just waiting it out. I know they keep doing more and more updates with e within each day. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure. So hopefully that'll be there next week. Like I said, if you're interested in that, let me know, Ian know, Brandon know. We'll get you, we'll get y'all fixed up um, and whatnot. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is shirts. Next week I want to have, I want to start shine, signing up for shirts um, because I have still have people that ordered last year that are asking me, are we still doing it? And I keep telling them, yes, we are. So let's just go ahead and get it done before. Uh, we leave for Thanksgiving. I just want to get everything done and out of the way. Uh, this is the front of the shirt. I know we've been over this a little bit, but just to give some people some uh, heads up what it is. Front and then the back. It just has everything that has meteorology in it or meteorology effects, I should say. Um, and then it has some clubs. Um, and then, obviously, our honor society for the geography department. Um. So yeah, I'll, next week we'll I'll pull it up. I still have the sheet from last semester um, of who's signed up, who's paid, who hasn't paid. Most of the people that have paid are uh, alumni. I just got to get the shirts and ship them to them. Uh, there was a lot of alumni that wanted them. Um, so yeah, we'll do that next week. And then the next thing we'll talk about some current weather. I found this really interesting. Uh, the outlook came out for temperature. And as you can see, the West Coast above average. Pretty much the east coast to right down the middle of the country is going to be below average. But why? Why does this happen? Well, let's look at, we can look at the GFS model here on pivotal weather. We can look at the wind speed here. And as we move forward, now granted, one thing I do need to point out, this map is valid the 29th through October 3rd. September 29th through October 3rd is when this map is valid. It was made today, but it's for six to ten days out. So six days from now is the 29th. And so if we go up here, and then we can see that as 29th approaches, we've really got a digging trough coming in here. And what happens here is as the 29th comes, as we're in this trough, uh, our area and just to the north and pretty much straight to the east of us is going to be in the cold region. And out west, as you can see, they're really not getting any colder air from the uh, polar air mass up here. And we go all the way out until October 3rd. And that's the same way. Um, same way. It'll be cold for us, uh, cooler for us, I should say. And there's nothing out there that brings them any cool air. Uh, and then one thing to point out with this as well is even if we go to 500 millibar, it shows up a little bit. Or it will show up pretty well, actually. And then here it is again. Same thing. Same thing as it goes out until the third, which is when that forecast ends. Um, and so they, even at the 500 millibar, you can see uh, these jet streams just kind of come together and cause us, our area to be cooler and out west to be warmer. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out here is if we go to precipitation, oops, 
There really is none, none whatsoever for our area. Um, even the middle of the country, which is okay, I guess for now, but out here it's neutral. Uh, so basically it's pretty much equal chances of rain out here, which they really need the rain in this whole area here pretty dang bad, um, which can be seen by this map here, actually. Uh, the U.S. Uh, drought monitor. Uh, so um, obviously for us, we've got some drought in the state. Our area, not – we're kind of almost in it and kind of almost out of it. I don't know if I click on it if it actually do anything. It won't. Okay, um, but those r big rains that we had uh, about a week ago really helped out this whole area right through here. Uh, we were pretty bad, and uh, it really helped out. Uh, we had well over three inches of rain that time. Uh, there was basically a th during a three-day span, we had three inches of rain. Um, but uh, this map uh, gets released tomorrow. The updated version will be tomorrow. So I would expect that it would kick back in that this area right through here uh, would actually be up. And this area here definitely hasn't received much rain since the last time. Really, have, the whole state hasn't received any rain probably in about a week. Um, so we'll we'll see what they say tomorrow as far as drought conditions go. I would expect this area to probably worsen a little bit. Uh, could stay the same. It's definitely going to get bigger as far as uh, the severe drought. It's definitely this is going to probably dip down into here, and it's going to extend over into here. Uh, but as far as complications of that, nothing yet. Uh, the only thing that this would really impact is if uh, so the farmers are in the fields, if there were to be an issue with one of their, let's say, combines, tractors, grain carts, that mechanical issue that would catch fire, it would probably set the whole field ablaze, and then you would have a big issue there. Uh, that's the main thing right now with farming season coming up, with it being dry. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll jump into my presentation about radar scope. Um, is there any questions about anything so far? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, so we will present this. Um, so radar scope uh, is a very, 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 very useful uh, software tool. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on your laptop, your iPad. Um, yeah, those are the three main things. Android, it doesn't really matter. Radar scope is out there. It's, um, I'll get into it, but I really, really, really love radar scope. It's, it's one of my favorites. What did I do? Okay. Um, so I'm only going to talk about dual pole radars, which is dual polarization, uh, which is what radar scope offers. Most of the, all the radars on radar scope are going to be dual pole. So basically what this means is the radars actually, uh, send out a signal in both the horizontal and vertical directions. Uh, so basically it's like, it's just a wave. It's a signal being getting sent out. Um, and the re main reason for this is to understand the targets that are being detected. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but that's the, that's the main thing. I think dual pole really became a thing within the past 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, maybe not even that long ago. And it's really helped out our understanding of being able to differentiate, um, what's going on in the storm. Uh, and I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll get into that. And it's, it's been, it's really, really useful and kind of amazing really how far radars have actually come. Uh, there are different types of radars um, that can see through storms. So basically the different bands of radar, as you go up a band, you're going to be more powerful. Uh, WI uses an X band, which is not nearly as powerful as uh, let's say the weather service radar, which is an S band radar. The S band radars, Typically, are, uh, price-wise, you're looking in the millions and millions of dollars to get that. So the one that got destroyed in Lake Charles, that is a very, very, very expensive fix, which NexRad has all of those radar parts on hand. So they'll um, they'll be able to uh, fix that within – it's going to take a little bit, but they've definitely it's, – it'll, it'll get fixed, but it's going to be an expensive fix, to say the least. And I don't really know when our radar is going to officially be uh, – ready to go. I haven't really heard much about it since uh, COVID started. I've been meaning to ask Dr. Finch, but I keep forgetting. Uh, yeah, our it's working. It's just not uh, out there yet. And it will eventually be on radar scope once we get it figured out. Um, once we get everything all figured out, it will be on there. And that's going to be a great thing for us um, and for the people that storm chase in this area, because it's, it's just terrible. It's um, the radar signal or coverage in this area. 
So radar scope, in my opinion, in most people's opinion, it's going to be the best radar app. There are other radar apps that are coming up. Um, radar Omega is another one that's becoming more and more used. Uh, Reed Timmer actually endorses radar scope, and I've bought radar scope or radar Omega, sorry, and I've bought radar Omega. There's some aspects of radar Omega that are very, very, very useful. Like they actually give you METAR reports, which is the temperature, the dew point. The, I think they also give wind, which is very, very useful when uh, you're out there storm chasing or looking at storms to see if they're going to, you know, what they're going to do. Um, and they also have a few other things that radar scope doesn't offer at the moment uh, that I think would be useful. Uh, but I, like I said, I, I, I prefer radar scope. It's, it's the best one out there in my opinion. Uh, it has the super resolution data uh, that comes directly from the national weather service radars. I believe radar Omega just has high resolution data until you subscribe. Once you pay their monthly fee or yearly fee, um, I believe you get the super resolution data in, and that does make a difference. The uh, high res data is more pixelated, and it's not as it's not as clear as a picture as uh, the super res data would be. Uh, it does cost ten bucks. It's a one time purchase from uh, mobile, and then it's thirty dollars on PC. And so from here, what you can do is actually um, subscribe. There's two tiers. Tier one is uh, ten bucks a year. I think it's ten bucks a year. It's either 10 or 12, but I'm pretty sure it's 10. Uh, that'll get you lightning data. It'll get you the dual pan or the dual frame data. So basically, you'll be able to look at two uh, radar parameters at once. So if you wanted to look at reflectivity and velocity, you can actually look at that uh, with the tier one subscription. Um, and you don't have to do this. Um, and it's the same cost for PC and mobile. Um, if you want to spend the $100 a year to get the tier two, which includes longer. Uh, Includes an archive of data. I believe it gives you a longer loop. So it includes the outlooks. Um, so the SPC outlooks, the tornado, the wind, the hail. And there's other things in there that it includes, but I'm not, I don't really mess with it that much. I have a completely different subscription for that. Instead of spending $100 a year, I think my, my subscription is like $165 a year for a whole different, another, for a whole other uh, radar software product, which I can, I'll present about eventually. Um, but uh, like I said, if you want to do the hundred dollars a year, not a problem. It's it's really useful if you're if you're big if you're a big weather nerd. It's it's nice, um, especially if you're out storm chasing. You probably should spend the hundred dollars a year on it if you don't have the other software. But uh, yeah, I, I like this a lot. And uh, so now we're getting ready to dig into the actual products. So this right here, I took these screenshots the other night um, when I was making this presentation. So this would would have been uh, yeah about a week ago. When's the twelfth? That would probably ten days ago, somewhere in there. Whenever we were getting all this rain, this was the night that we got, I think, over two inches of rain. That could have been a different night. Somewhere in that day, we did get a, a, over two inches of rain. Uh, and this is super res reflectivity data. Um, and what is being shown here is uh, the return to the radar of in decibels. So basically, I mean, I'm sure most of you know this, but the higher, the brighter the color, the heavier the rain's going to be. Um, and so what ends up happening is, so the Davenport radar is right somewhere right in through here. And as this beam comes outward, it's actually bending, it's curving with the earth. And so, um, what happens is the farther away you get, the more distorted, it's not curving with the earth, I guess, it, as it comes out, it's seeing higher in the atmosphere. So it gets a little distorted around here because it's actually looking higher up and it's not looking at the base of the clouds. And so even if, since this is on a uh, 0.5 degree tilt, which is the lowest tilt that they offer, and it should be looking at the surface. So basically anywhere and probably within this little area of Davenport's definitely being uh, scanned near the surface of the clouds, but anywhere once you get out past probably Fort Madison into Macomb up through Canton, you're looking into basically the mid-level of the clouds. And you can actually look into the mid-level of the clouds if you were, um, if you wanted to, even if you were in, let's say, Alito or Kiwani or Eldridge, you can select these tilts. Uh, it's half a degree tilt, uh, 0.8 degree tilt, 1.2 degree tilt, and 1.7 degree tilt. So basically, if, if especially if you're out storm chasing and you wanted to see, is there a rotation in the upper part of this, in this upper part of this cloud structure, you might bump up your tilt to 1.2 to see if there is rotation up there. And what that basically gives you is, okay, it is rotating in the higher atmosphere. Will that 
will that be stretched downward to, towards the surface? And so you might go back and forth to see if it's getting stretched downward. And eventually, if it's at point A, then at point five, you're seeing rotation. You're thinking, okay, this storm might actually produce a tornado or something like that. So that's what the tilts do. And then reflectivity is just basically showing you uh, how how much rain's coming. Um, and uh, just, yeah, the rain, the amount of rainfall, really. Um, and so if you guys have any questions at all during this, just don't be afraid to jump in because I, I like to talk. So I can I don't have an issue of just keep talking and talking and talking. So, yeah, just jump in if you have any questions whatsoever. Um, OK, so the next product I want to talk about now, when we talk about radar scope products, there are so many products. I only picked out the ones that I think are the most useful right now. There's so many. Uh, and some of them, I really don't even know what they do. Um, but for the most part, the ones I've talked about or going to talk about, I know what they do. Um, and I'm, I've used them a lot. So they're really, really useful. And so the next one is this precipitation depiction. Uh, you can actually tell, uh, it'll tell you if it's rain, snow, or sleet. So the rain will be the greenish, and then it'll pretty much look like the uh, base reflectivity. And then as you get into snow, it's blue, and sleet is that pinkish purplish color uh well yeah pinkish purplish purplish is probably slate and pink ice uh, it's really really useful in the winter especially trying to figure out that rain snow line that's basically what most people are going to use it for and there's actually another tool i will show here in a minute that will give you another another uh look in to see where that rain snow line is and most people won't think about it but if you do and you actually look at this you can definitely tell where that rain snow line is. And so uh, the next one is the super resolution velocity. So what this does, it tells you how the winds are turning in the storm. Um, you can see the directions of the wind. Green is toward the radar and red is away from the radar. Um, and if you have something that looks like this, this is definitely a tornado is more than likely 98% of the time going to be on the ground. And this tornado here, this is that Bassfield, Mississippi tornado uh, from near Easter this past year. It's a very, very high-end EF4, possibly EF5. I don't even think they're done surveying this area yet. Um, and this is not my picture. I got it from off of Twitter from Mark Weinberg. I, I know I'm pronouncing his name wrong. But, uh, but yeah, this once you get a tight couplet like this, that's when you know – that there's more than likely a tornado on the ground. Um, and I almost 98% of the time, if it's like this, there's something big. You don't get you don't get tight colors like this whenever you get, especially when you start getting purple, when it's supposed to be green, you know things are gonna be getting out of hand, and then you get these pink colors over here. Um, yeah, this this was a very, very large tornado on the ground right here. Um, and I'll actually show you how we know we can confirm it from radar here in the next slide, maybe. Nope, it's coming up. Okay, so um, this is digital accumulation array. Um, it's the one hour storm difference of rainfall. So that first picture I showed you of the base reflectivity, this is what was showing up here. Uh, as you see here, more rain from just west of Keokuk is being measured within the past hour. This is a dual polarization product, so it's it, it's pretty high resolution. This is updated once per scan, so every time the radar makes a full scan, it's updated. Uh, so if you want to know, is there flash flooding occurring right now in my area, this is what you would look for. Uh, this is what the National Weather Service would look at if they wanted to see, okay, this storm looks like it's um, producing a lot of heavy rain over one area. What is it doing? What has it done within the last hour? Uh, what's it doing right now? And once you get the brighter colors in here, you know that there was a lot of rain, and chances are uh, it will show you uh, it, the National Weather Service will issue a flash flood warning. And the good thing also about radar scope with flash flood warnings, if you click on the warning, it'll show you the radar product that the National Weather Service used to issue the warning. So if you ever if you get radar scope and you actually want to see how much rain's falling, there's a flash flood warning in your area, you can choose. Uh, once you click on the flash flood warning, it'll either be the digital accumulation array or it'll be this right here, the digital storm total accumulation. Um, and so what happens is in that flash flood warning, they will put this product, either the, the array or the storm total accumulation in that product. And then you can go back and actually look and see, OK, what are the radar estimates for this storm, which is really nice uh, whenever you're thinking, 
you know, how much rain have we gotten? And as you can see here, the array had this area right down here, here, just northwest of Quincy, as you know, that was their area for the last hour. But if we use the storm total accumulation, we know we can see here that just west of Cedar Rapids, they had a lot of rain earlier in the day. And that's what this is picking up on. It's picking up on earlier in the day rainfall totals. Um, and the other thing is this does not update every scan of the radar. Typically, it'll probably be anywhere from 8 to 12 minute updates. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's not. It just depends what they have their radar um, set in as for as for the event. So some some radars, they can turn the radar to actually produce uh, faster images. You can have it produce an image every two minutes or it could produce an image every five minutes. Somewhere in there, it just depends on what the weather service at that particular location is thinking or wanting their radar to go. Um, and then typically on most events when it's on two minutes and it's going all day like that, the radar will break and it will not be useful for a day or two afterwards because something always goes wrong whenever it's working that hard. Um, and I would say probably it's a 30% of the time that happens whenever it works hard, it'll typically break within the next day or two because it just works so hard to get all those images out so fast. Um, okay, so this is what I was talking about with the velocity. Oh, no, it's not. It's a whole different thing. Okay. So, this, I mean, this could work with this, and I actually took this picture. Um, this was in March of last year, probably, whenever I was still at school, but we didn't have school, and there was a storm just north or just west of town. Um, so this actually will tell us, uh, it'll differentiate between vertical and horizontal particles. So it'll tell us between rain and hail is the main thing. Uh, that's exactly what this will pick up. Uh, so the, basically the two circle regions here are what we need to look out for. So if you have these images like this on dual pane and you see the top image, you see those bright colors there. The bright colors that are circled, that's actually inflow into the storm. And the other color right, the other circle right above it, that is actually going to be hail. And if we look at the reflectivity below, we can actually see that's probably the 100% case because the top circle is in an area of high DVZ value, which typically indicates hail if it's going to be pink like that. Um, and so we can probably say there's hail there, and I can confirm that there was hail there. We got hailed on. Um, so there definitely was hail there. And then that lower circle, it's actually the inflow. And we can kind of see that because if you look at the bottom here just to the west of Colchester, on both sides there's those little hooks. Those are called the inflow notches. And so the inflow winds are coming in there, and which keeps these hail particles, um, it keeps them held up in the atmosphere until they become too heavy and they fall. And so this is a good, a good indication, you know, of that it's it's probably hailing because these hail particles are being suspended in the air from this inflow. They're just getting too heavy and they fall out. I think that day we had uh, probably a little bit bigger than quarter size hail come through. Probably not golf ball, maybe a few golf balls here and there, but it wasn't wasn't anything uh, bigger than golf balls for sure. But there was a report this day in somewhere just somewhere near Burlington that they, they had softball size hail that day. I didn't I, I don't know if it was ever confirmed. Somebody I think one of the emergency managers uh, sent into the weather service was softball size hail that day. So we were really hoping to catch some baseballs or softballs, but we took. Uh, quarters and some maybe maybe a few golf balls here and there but yeah basically this is this product here the main thing to look out for is if you overlay these two images if you see that there's a gray color in the differential reflectivity that overlaps with a uh, pinkish color down here and the reflectivity chances are there's some hail in there um i i would almost bet money that there's going to be hail in that storm and for the most part, it, it, there probably there is hail on that storm. So just that's the main thing to look for when you're looking at differential reflectivity. It do the gray areas line up with the pink areas, and is there a brighter color somewhere near that gray area? Um, and if there is, that's the inflow, and then the gray area that is uh, overlapped with the with the higher DBZ values is hail. That is the main thing to look for here. And then if we go to correlation coefficient, so this is what I was trying to get with with the velocity. So basically the above image is the velocity. It's kind of a, a bad little area here. This is in New Orleans from over the summer. There was a tornado on the ground in this area. 
and had this picture saved. Um, so what ends up happening is as the tornado is on the ground, this correlation coefficient, it's detecting, detecting different size of particles. So this actually will pick up ground debris. So if a tornado moves through, once you get these green, blue colors down here in areas where this couplet is overlaid, so if you see this couplet and you overlay this with correlation coefficient and you see these two match up, this is what the National Weather Service is going to call a radar confirmed tornado because this is basically telling them that this tornado is on the ground and it is pick it is picking up debris, whether that be trees, houses, um, any anything that the tornado can destroy that gets picked up in the atmosphere, this correlation coefficient will pick it up on radar. It'll, it'll show it on radar. Oops. And so what happens is, that, yeah, the Weather Service will say this is a radar confirmed tornado because that there is a, it's also called the debris ball. So if you ever hear the word debris ball, that is exactly where it's coming from, from the supervised correlation coefficient. Um, and the debris ball might not be this uh, entirely, but it, it'll, it's it, it pretty much the same thing. Uh, but the debris ball is basically from uh, super red or from base reflectivity, but this is pretty similar to the same thing. Um, and if you ever hear a tornadic debris signature, that is this, this right here. It's, it's very, very useful when trying to see, okay, is there really a tornado or is there not a tornado? And you might get the very smallest, um, very smallest bluish greenish colors, but that's when you know there was a tornado there. Uh, so it's very nice, uh, very nice product to have in your back pocket when you're storm chasing. Uh, so basically just be like, okay, you know, I see that there is a couplet. Can I see that the, if there is a uh, tornadic debris signature? And if there is, that's where you want to be because that chances are where there's a tornado. And the next one is the hydrometer classification. Um, so I don't use this a whole lot, but it is kind of useful to know. Uh, basically, it can tell you what the precip type is. Now, there's two different ones. The one, the image on the left here is the hydrometer classification, and the image on the right is the hybrid hydrometer classification. Um, so if you're going to use this, all these colors down here, these all represent different items, and I should have them in order here. The, the gray should, the lighter gray should be clutter, and then you go to ice crystals, and you go to dry snow, wet snow, light rain, heavy rain, big drops, grapple, light or hail slash rain, large hail, and giant hail. Uh, this was really the only image I had available of the of this that I found online, um, and it's from somebody that actually is on RadarScope, so this is not my image, and I can't really see his name right now to give him credit for it, but it is down there. Um, and so this basically, from my understanding, is the image on the left, uh, most of these colors here probably aren't there, uh, but if you, I mean, obviously, if you compare it with the image on the right, that is probably what it is. They use different algorithms to get these images. And so if, you, if you're out, you know, if you see a storm coming near you, you're out storm chasing and you use this hybrid hydrometer classification um, and you see that you're getting some red or yellows or even purples, that's when you know that this thing is saying, okay, based on the water in the atmosphere, this is actually producing some hail, maybe even giant hail. Uh, which is, can be useful if you're in your car and you want to get the heck out of there so you don't get pummeled by hail, or if you're like me and you want to sit and get pummeled by hail. I mean, either or, I mean, I like some hail. So, um, so yeah, this right here is basically just showing you uh, basically the precipitation that is depicting within the atmosphere. Uh, and, and unlike the, uh, the other one I showed you with that can depict, you know, rain, snow, and stuff, this actually picks out the bigger particles, the actual drops the stones from the hail, the grapples, um, anything like that, which is really nice when you're out there. But, you know, uh, this one's not used a whole lot by me and probably not a lot by others, but it, it is useful to know that it does exist. Now, this here, the enhanced echo tops, this is what I use almost, oh, my goodness, all the time. This is this is the one that I'm looking at constantly whenever, whenever I'm seeing storms develop, and you can actually see storms go absolutely nuts on this. So this gives you the values of the tops of the clouds. So basically the bluer, greener colors are at the lower of the spectrum. But once you get into the orange and the yellows and even the reds sometimes, the reds are pretty rare to get into, but if you do, 
Chances are this will tell you how strong the storm's going to be. So this was that uh, original base reflectivity image I showed. Uh, as we can see, you know, the rain moving through, really they didn't have that high of a uh, cloud top, so they're not going to be any strong storms. But this is how you can tell if a storm is going to be strong. If you have a storm that, if you have a cloud that's typically greater than 50,000 feet, um, you, it, it's, it's, chances are it's going to be severe. Um, and if it's not severe, it's going to dump a lot of rain and probably some small hail in your area, and you might get some strong winds. That typically just says that, you know, this storm is tall enough that it can do some damage. Uh, and so, like, whenever I'm out storm chasing, I will have this pulled up every other minute. But the only good thing, the only bad thing is it doesn't update that fast. It has to go through one full scan to give you um, an update. And that's the worst part about it. But it is so useful in seeing where storms are developing as well. So you might see these images, these colors, these cloud tops on on this, but you will not see them on reflectivity because it's not raining. And so if you're out there and you know, you're like, you're like, okay, I see a storm developing and someone's like, well, it's not on reflectivity. Well, you can see on this thing here that the cloud tops are going up. It is, you know, as the storm is getting stronger and maturing, it's gonna get taller, it's gonna get bigger. And so that's how you can tell um, if there are storms developing and you're not, and you don't have a satellite image next to you. This is exactly uh, what you can do. And the main thing you gotta know here though, you gotta know your beam height your radar beam height. So this thing here, this radar is up in Davenport right here. And as it's projecting, as it's coming out here, you see it go all the way down here, which it's not, it's not going down here. I don't, I mean, even if it is, you are, you're looking at the tops of the clouds already. You're not even, this, it will give you distortion values farther away from the radar. So you need to know where you're at in relation to the radar and to basically give you a great a great estimate of the cloud tops. This so like into here, you can pretty much throw all these out because it's, chances are it's not going to be right. You probably want to be in the St. Louis radar if you want to look into here. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in the Davenport radar if I was if I was in Palmyra. I'd be probably in the LSX radar. I might switch back and forth to see which one uh, seems more reasonable. But once you get south of Quincy, you need to be in the LSX radar um, that will give you a better view of the cloud top so basically that's the main thing you really need to know know your beam height and you can actually there's a function on here that you can uh when selecting uh selecting something you can actually i forgot what the actual tool name is but you can uh click on the radar and basically drag it and it'll tell you how high up your beam height is so let's say i mean you might have a beam height of that's 2700 feet in the air but that's seeing you know that's that's pretty high beam height, but you might have a beam height, you know, that's, that's even farther than that. So you basically, you just need to know and basically put two and two together is what I'm seeing actually happening. Um, you know, just kind of look around and be like, okay, you know, I, I can, I can believe that. And if it's not happening, you can kind of just throw it out and look at different radars and see what happens. But that's the main thing. Just basically, you know, make sense of it is what I'm trying to say. It's, see if it's good, see if it's actually real. Um, and then, so the next thing that we can talk about here are, uh, these are called gust fronts or outflow boundaries. So if you look at this little green line here, that's basically just west of Waverly, going through Palmyra, about to enter Carlinville, these are called gust fronts or outflow boundaries. So what happens here, this is rain cool air that is being uh, pushed out in front of a moving thunderstorm line or squall line. They're either called gust fronts or outflow boundaries, and chances are, what ends up happening is as these uh, rain cooled air boundaries move, propagate forward, it's actually cooling the air in front of this. So any of the air that gets sucked up into this storm is cold. And so nine times out of 10, these things are gonna die off. The storm behind it will die nine times out of 10. There are exceptions. Um, Mother nature isn't always nice. She kind of likes to make fun of you sometimes. So there's some, these will show up pretty, they're pretty common in the late season in July around here, July, July, August, you know, maybe late June. Um, basically, whenever there's not enough shear in the atmosphere to keep these things organized, these things will happen. They will come out. Um, like I said, it's rain cool there rushing out from, from this thunderstorm because it's just not moving that fast. Um, and some move fast and still have them. So basically it, it, it's it's on the day. I mean, you might you're, these are very very easy to pick up on radar, 
And chances are, um, if you're in front of these, so Carlinville, they could have very well have seen 30, 40, 45, 50 mile an hour winds from this thing. These things pack a punch when they come out you. Um, it gets cold and it gets windy when these things hit you. Um, earlier this summer, we had one hit my house. I live right here in Mortonville. Um, we had one hit my house and it took out my neighbor's tree. It didn't rain, didn't anything. Just one of these boundaries came through and it just knocked the tree right over. Probably, oh, 50, 55 mile an hour winds probably. Uh, maybe even pushing 60. But it was, it was interesting to see that. It wasn't from the storm itself, but it was from this little boundary. Um, like I said, these are very easy to pick up on radar. Uh, and I'll show you another one here. This one here, I'm actually kind of wondering, is this really an outflow boundary? Um, I'm thinking this very well could also be a front. Uh, sometimes if the fronts are orientated the right way, this could be a warm front advancing or it could be a cold front. I, I don't really know if this is a front or if it's a, um, a gust front or outflow boundary, if it's an actual warm front or cold front. I would assume it's a boundary. Sometimes, you know, these storms will pop off this boundary, depending on the conditions behind it. But like I said, nine times out of the 10, they won't. But in certain conditions, storms will just fire as this thing moves forward because what it does is this acts like another lifting mechanism. As it comes through, it's pushing that warmer air up because this is colder air. And as you do, you know, you get your air particles to rise and then you're going to have storms and rain. So it's 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 hard saying what this really was. I would say it's still a gust front, um, but it, it's a very, very interesting case of one. Now, you'll have these every now and then. This was in May. So basically in May, this is very, very possible um, to have storms fire off of these. Um, it's it's there. You never know what you're really going to get until the day happens. And like, like this day here, they got a lot of rain up there near Bloomington in between Lincoln and Clinton. Um, and I think I was actually in Kansas this day. And I saw this on my phone and I was like, okay, you know, that's kind of cool. So I saved this image um, just as future reference. Um, and this here, this actually is happening around here. If you look at um, the Lincoln radar, the Quad Cities radar, I think those are the two radars that come in. I don't know if Chicago might catch the ones near Galesburg. But um, it was random, and I made this so I couldn't get, get ours to show up. But these little things here just north of Cheyenne Wells, just south of Colby, right into here, east of Hugo, north of Lyman, these are wind farms. Um, and they will show up on radar. And so these are just stationary objects. As you see, they're not moving. They're not moving at all. They're going to be there. They're staying there. They actually just create their own little weather. As these things move, it distorts the atmosphere that the radar is seeing, and it'll sh it'll show up as reflectivity. But then it's not raining there or anything. It's just it's just the wind turbines operating. So there's nothing we can do about it besides if we wanted to raise our beam height up, which is what we're doing here because of those new ones just north of town. We actually have to raise our beam height up to make sure we get above them, so that way we're not getting interference from these all the time. And I've actually talked to people from the National Weather Service. And they are not happy about wind farms. They hate them. I mean, they say, you know, it's good for the environment. But during severe weather, these can actually screw with, screw with the weather. So what happens is, as a storm moves into these, it actually might look like it dissipates. And if you remember correctly, if you remember the uh, terrible tornado on December 1st of 2018, I think that was, almost two years ago, there was a guy from... News Channel, I think it was News Channel 20. Yeah, News Channel 20, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, it was News Channel 20 or WAND TV out of Decatur. Um, they said as this storm was approaching Decatur, it was weakening. Or as it was, you know, approaching and leaving Decatur, it was weakening. But it actually entered wind farms over there, and it showed like it was weakening. And I talked, I talked to people from the Weather Service, and they were not happy with this meteorologist that said that. Because they knew it entered the wind farm, and they knew that the wind farm was actually affecting how it was showing up on Doppler radar. They knew it wasn't weakening, but whoever that meteorologist was didn't realize that it was entering the wind farm. And that is why he said it was weakening. And the other meteorologist on a different channel knew it was, and he said he didn't mention anything about weakening. But he, um, 
uh, yeah, they were they were not happy about that incident, and they're not happy about uh, wind farms in total. One meteorologist from the National Weather Service I talked to actually said he wrote a letter to Congress asking them to please tell the people that run the wind farms to turn them off during severe weather. You know, if they if they could turn them off during severe weather, that would be the greatest thing they could ever do. He said, you know, it would help us out. And I mean, obviously, they're not probably won't be on anyway. You get winds that are just destroy the the turbines off of them. But um, yeah, they, he said he wrote a letter to Congress. Now, I don't really, I haven't talked to him since then. Uh, what happened with that letter? But yeah, he was he was he's very adamant that he does not want them on during severe weather because there's also a whole bunch of them named Lincoln, and he was from Lincoln. Uh, or he is from Lincoln, and yeah, he he wants them turned off fast, and especially during severe weather. Like he said, he didn't care if they were on, but during severe weather, it just screws with the way the radar sees the storm, um, and that's that's the main thing with the wind farms. There's, I know that that's the end of my presentation, and I've got some sources here, um, but the main thing, I mean, there's so many other things that radar has that I, I didn't go over Um but it it's there's there's so much more that I could talk about, um, and I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I could probably I, I oh my gosh I could talk about radar for years, um, but it's there's there's some stuff that is very very complex. There's some stuff that's very simple to understand, and I I don't know. I probably barely know half of it. There's so much more out there. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird to think, you know, like radars, it's not really a new tool, but with this dual pool, it's new. Um, we're seeing things we've never seen before. Um, and it's, it's, it's so neat to see the advances that radar is having. Uh, there's, oh my gosh, there's just so much, so much more things. And that's just one, one software radar. I mean, I can make another presentation on radar Omega if I wanted to, I'll probably make another presentation on, I guess I could just show you this real fast since we're talking about radars. There's another radar software called uh, GR, it's Gibson Ridge software. And so what happens here is this costs $80 for the base subscription. Um, then it's $165 to get super resolution radar data. Um, this is not accurate right now. Um, so it's 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 worth it if you're gonna storm chase. If you're gonna, this is what the only thing I use when I storm chase is um, is this radar here. Uh, you can do so much with it. There's so much like the I I I'll, I will make a presentation about this at some point. But this is what I use. And there's so many useful applications of this that's not even funny. Um, but yeah, this is this is the main one I use, and there's so many other different radar apps um but if you want if you're out there storm chasing or at home wondering what's coming i definitely would use radar scope you can use the weather channels one but it doesn't show you much i mean it'll show you how heavy the rain is that's about it it won't show you uh, if the storm's rotating or anything like that uh but but yeah so that's the end of my presentation uh do you guys have any questions No. Okay. Um, so my last question to you guys is, yeah. I don't have a question, but um, towards the beginning you said uh, Kiwani. It's Kiwani. I just wanted to point that out oh, because okay. some people will look at you funny. Okay. No, I, 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 I call it, I call, I call it Kiwani occasionally, but uh, I guess today was not one of those days. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so. Um, next week, what do you guys want to do? You guys want to try to play games next week? Do you want to do another presentation? Do you guys have any um, preferences at all? I mean, I really don't care, honestly. I can probably get another presentation ready, but if we wanted to play a game, I don't know what we would play on a computer. So, like, I looked at, I looked up trying to get in, trying to do a, uh, like a uh, escape room thing, but it's like 30 bucks a person. I was like, I ain't doing that. So I was like, okay, you know, but um, yeah, 
we'll try to figure out something for next week. It might be another presentation. It might not be. I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, so we'll see. And if you guys, you guys, any any further questions before we end this? No. Okay. Well, it was great having you guys, and we will see you all next week. Thank you for being here.